So I am so happy that we were able to bring Jeff to join us here in LA for this event. Jeff is the CEO of Starlight Runner Entertainment and is the world's leading expert at expanding entertainment properties, premium brands, and socio-political themes into highly successful transmedia franchises and international campaigns. As a consultant to Fortune 500 companies, Jeff contributes strategic planning and production for the extension of narrative content across digital and traditional platforms. He extends the story worlds of films, toys, books, animation, video game titles um, across multiple access points, generating massive fan communities and uh, multiple revenue streams. And his pop culture work has impacted such blockbuster entertainment franchises as Pirates of the Caribbean, Avatar, Transformers, The Amazing Spider-Man, and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. So he's worked <laughs> on a lot of the big stuff out there. Um, and tonight, Jeff's going to be talking about some of the proprietary transmedia development and implementation methods that he's been using applying it to social and, ge and geopolitical causes, particularly in the area of population activation. He's consulted on projects of national impact in Mexico and Colombia, and his work has impacted large communities in Italy, England, and Afghanistan. Jeff was honored with the Director's Coin for Excellence for his peace-building work in tandem with the United States Special Operations Command Interagency Task Force, and the Phyllis Hyman Fat Friend Award for his work with Edge Children in New York City. So please join me in welcoming Jeff. Hey. Now, does that bio make me a nerd or what? <laughs> wow. <laughs> um, that's my uh, uh, Twitter feed, guys, at uh, Jeff underscore Gomez. Remember the underscore because the other Jeff Gomez who doesn't have the underscore gets really upset with me uh, sometimes. <laughs> um, it's amazing to be able to, uh, uh, to finally uh, talk about this uh, on our shores. Um, I I've gotten to talk a little bit about it um, overseas where um, uh, the interest um, in Avatar is, is balanced with <laughs> an interest in politics and other things that uh, make life uh, happen. Um, so thank you, uh, Nidra, and everybody here. Um, uh, it's it's a, a tremendous pleasure. I've been looking forward to doing this a long time. Now, I have not done this frequently, so forgive me if I say um a lot. Uh, I'm not a professional speaker, I, I, I'm a producer and I go out and do these things, uh, but I feel really passionately about this, so I want to, um, I want to somehow uh, push through a little stage fright and talk to you uh, about it. Um, we, um, if it's one thing that I learned maybe the hard way, um, it's that um, uh, as a person who's lived through um, some pain and, and some difficult times. Um, the, the physical aspect of, of pain, in retrospect, was small. The, the real pain, the pain that I personally suffered in, in my life, came from the fact that I didn't understand what was going on. Um, uh, the, um, the real pain um, for me, and I have discovered for, for many, many people in the world, comes from a lack of knowledge. Um, I was born in the uh, early 1960s in, uh, in New York City. Um, uh, my mom and dad were of mixed race. Uh, mom was a nice Jewish girl. Dad was a tough guy, Puerto Rican. Um, they, they met uh, across Houston Street. There was a kind of divide uh, down the Lower East Side of uh, Manhattan. And, um, and when they uh, connected, um, troubles began. <laughs> this was not looked upon favorably by most anybody at, at, at that time. My mother was also very young, uh, so I was born um, 
when she was, uh, wow, just like around uh, 16 years old, 15, 16 years old, and um, uh, growing up, she, she had to leave her family and eventually move in with, uh, with Jose's, <laughs> Jose Gomez, um, and, um, and I was raised in, uh, in the projects uh, of the Lower East Side, the Baruch projects, uh, Houston Street and East River Drive. Um, I was um, uh, a very different kind of animal from Jose. Um, my, my mom um, uh, infused in me the values of, uh, of, of reading, um, of, of being inquisitive, of wearing my hair kind of long. It was the 60s. <laughs> and um, uh, Dad didn't really understand any of this, and neither did his parents uh, with whom we lived. Um, so I, I, I automatically felt kind of um, distant, kind of alien uh, from them. I also was born uh, a forceps delivery, which damaged uh, the seventh facial nerve, um, which uh, gave me a kind of crooked smile. It was very pronounced when I was young, which, uh, which had its own set of problems uh, for me. As soon as I began um, uh, socializing, outside of the home, there would always be this, these questions, and questions would turn into teasing and, uh, and ultimately uh, bullying. And, uh, and so I, I became withdrawn. My world was a world of imagination, where I would stay in my uh, bedroom and uh, play with uh, dinosaurs, and I'd watch Godzilla movies, and, um, and I was uh, really particularly attracted to uh, Japanese cartoons, anime. Um, in the 60s, it was Speed Racer and uh, Tobor the Eighth Man and Gigantor. Um, these were uh, cartoons that were very serious. Um, in, in fact, back then, they didn't cut the fact that, that uh, uh, human beings were killed, you know, characters died and, and things like that. And, and that was, I, I vibed with that. <laughs> um, uh, the one... Um, the one time where a little bit of a bridge was built between me and uh, Bobby was, um, was when the uh, uh, Mexican wrestlers were on TV. He'd call me, which was rare, and, and I'd come out and he'd say, sit down, they're on. Um, so I got to sit on the couch with Dad. Um, and, and, um, and although... If someone was going to get bloody, I'd freak out, <laughs> which really pissed him off. Um, but um, but I, I'd get you know scared of that. What I was drawn to was the fact that they're wearing masks, that they're larger than life, that they're kind of heroic clashes between good and evil. Um, one day we were in a candy store, and I saw uh, a comic book that looked a lot like that. And I said, isn't that the, the guy from the TV? And... Uh, El Santo, and, and he said, uh, yeah, and he bought me the comic book. Um, and uh, uh, I, I, I was fascinated with the fact that, that these characters <coughs> manifested themselves essentially in another medium. Uh, there were also movies. El Santo fought the mummy and the vampires and, and so forth. They were very dramatic. And... Um, and they were on channel 47, and, um, and Dad called me in, and, and I'd see this and, and see that outside the ring, these guys were like superheroes. They were awesome. Um, and there was a kind of mythology around um, uh, these characters, and, um, uh, and I fell in love with the notion that, um, that I could surround myself with um, this kind of fantasy world that I loved, um, and I loved its richness, and I began to imagine rich fantasy worlds um, uh, to kind of entertain myself, amuse myself. Um, when, uh, when I go to school, and this was a really tough neighborhood, uh, I'm five, six, seven years old, um, I, I started to learn to do something when I reached the uh, th threshold, the doorway of a, of a classroom or any new environment. 
and I call this threshold assessment. Um, I have to step in and look around and as quickly as possible discern who was most likely to call me twisted mouth or broke face or, or whatever, and, um, and who was actually a real physical threat. And, um, and over some time, I began to figure, figure out something interesting. There were patterns that were going on. There was a dynamic to this little tiny community of small people um, in, in this room, and, and that is that when the bully entered the room, behavior changed. Um, and it changed automatically. It wasn't even as if the bully was doing something that was hostile. Um, their expectations were that eventually there would be a hostile act, so they began to, to behave in whatever defensive way uh, they were. And, um, and I, I actually kind of empathized with the bully because that made him an outsider, that, that made him somebody who people weren't really paying attention to. They weren't listening to him. And, and so it, it seemed to promulgate a cycle because then he'd provoke in order to get the response and, and there it went again. So, so, um, uh, so I tried a little experiment and would kind of eavesdrop on what he was talking about at any given time. And, um, and he liked things like any little kid liked things, so motorcycles and snakes and, and things like that. And um, uh, in fact, one day I went home and asked a neighbor who was friendly to me, I said, tell me everything you know about motorcycles. And he said, Jeff, you are the last person in the world who would have any interest in a motorcycle. <laughs> Mr. Dinosaur Boy. Um, and... Um, he was right. I said, just please tell me. And he did. Um, uh, he gave me some of the parts and, and, and so forth, the, the big um, brands. And, and um, uh, I took that, and one Saturday, I found Diablito, um, uh, who was working on his bike. And uh, I summoned the courage to uh, mumble a few things about motorcycles behind him. Uh, he was kneeled down, and you know, he turned around. This was a little kid, but I'd swear there was a mustache on his face. I mean, uh, and um, he gave me the foulest of looks. And I was like, that's cool. <laughs> Backed away and left. Um, on Monday, in the schoolyard, as usual, somebody was throwing me up against a chain link fence. Um, and about to really have at me, when I heard, yo, leave me alone. It was Diablito. <laughs> uh, the guy let me alone, smoothed my shirt, and left. <laughs> and there I was, standing next to Diablito. And um, no, it didn't turn into an ABC after school special. We, we didn't become fast friends. <laughs> we <laughs> had very little in common. We went our separate ways, but I learned something. Um, listening is incredibly powerful. Listening was going to be my friend. Um, I, I got older. Um, I, um, for a brief time, we moved to Hawaii. My mom was a free spirit. Dad had left um, uh, back to Puerto Rico. Um, so. Uh, we went to, to Hawaii, and, um, and that was cool because I was 6,000 miles closer to Japanese anime. <laughs> um, and, uh, and I learned something uh, in, in that year that I was there. It was 1975, and Japanese kid vid uh, had invaded Hawaii. Superheroes and uh, giant robots and... Um, uh, uh, monsters and, and things like that. And what was fascinating about the Japanese was that um, uh, after the, the Second World War, uh, that country was devastated and um, uh, a campaign to kind of revive its economy um, unleashed um, intellectual property 
from any single corporation's ownership. So you had to share your, your company secrets in order to get everybody kind of standing up. It was a, the term for it is kiretsu, um, uh, the, the sharing of, uh, of information to, to help one another. Now where this uh, applied to me was, was that um, creators uh, of uh, Japanese comic strips um, uh, if, if those comic strips became popular, a television network could very easily pick up the rights to, to the comic, a toy company can do the same, and a, a, motion, a motion picture company could, could do the same thing, and it happened all at once. And, um, and there was enough respect for the creator of the comic strip uh, to allow him to move from one company to the next to oversee the telling of the story. So what you got were cross-platform story worlds. That was awesome. I learned about, they, they were called the manga ka. They were so cool. They, they, um, they, they lived these uh, glamorous lives, moving from, from uh, one company to the next, telling the, this kind, orchestrating this story with prequels and sequels and sidequels and crossovers and uh, it was like uh, Marvel Comics come to life. Um, that's what I wanted to be. Uh, the Japanese wouldn't have me <laughs> so I was 12. Um, so I had to wait a while um, and, uh, and of course we started to see signs of this kind of uh, um, uh, multi-platform storytelling in uh, the early 80s when Star Wars became super popular and, um, and when uh, a kind of Hollywood blockbusters began to uh, flourish. Um, at, uh, at Queens College, um, I, I, um, I still determined to, to create multi-platform stories from scratch. I discovered something called Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> um, this was essentially communal storytelling. Uh, a referee, a dungeon master, all right, we're getting into geek territory here, uh, super geek. Um, a, a dungeon master uh, gathered a group of players together. Uh, they were assigned roles or created uh, a roles and uh, engaged in a kind of medieval fantasy story where, um, where you could play a wizard, a warrior, an elf, uh, a, a cleric, what have you, and you'd go off and battle monsters uh, in a world that was described to you by the dungeon master. And conflicts were um, resolved with rolling funny shaped dice. Um, uh, what, uh, what I was interested in here was um, uh, something a little bit more than the number crunching and the blood and the uh, gold uh, aspect of Dungeons and Dragons. Um, I was interested in using my little threshold assessment method to, to get people to, um, to really invest in the story, because I like the attention, frankly. Um, and I loved uh, weaving these rich, complex uh, story worlds. So, um, so I would ask my players questions, dozens and dozens of questions. And you know what? They answered them. Why? Because these guys who went to Queens College they're working class Joes. They're, they're just, you know, um, uh, they're not brainiacs or anything. Nobody, nobody's asked them these kinds of questions. Nobody had asked them about their values, their aspirations, their dreams, uh, their fantasies. Um, and so I would take those answers and weave them into a rich, complex narrative. And I would see, um, while we were playing, um, uh, the flash in the eyes of, of my players as they would um, uh, recognize something that, that they had talked about with me folded into the game. It was really powerful. They came back week after week. My little group started growing because word got out that I was a good dungeon master. What kind of... I, I never was going to get a date, was I? Um, uh, 5, 10, 15, 20 people. I was running games with 20 people sitting around the table with roles. Some of those people 
waiting an hour or more to even say or do anything. Uh, and and an, an audience, people would come to watch because it was very melodramatic, melodramatic and, and there were moral crises and um, uh, the creatures were, were described and acted out and, and things, things like that. Um, this, this is, is the world, world Corridor, Corridor um, where, where, where it all took place. place. And, and um, uh, what, what, um, what, what, what happened, happened after that, that really kind of set the stage for me because some of my players were a little bit nerdy and had these bizarre uh, typewriter televisions in their houses. And um, I would ask them, what's going on with that? And they'd say, well, I'm playing kind of a game of Dungeons and Dragons with somebody 3,000 miles away. And, and actually, actually there's, there's a few people that are connected to this, and so we're all playing together. And I said, oh, <laughs> um, n now I know how to get the job done. Now I, I figured it out. Um, there's a way for a thousand people to play this game. There's a way for uh, a million people to, to uh, connect under a kind of common narrative and, and, and become intrinsically involved. Become involved because I, I could imagine this becoming pictures and maybe even motion pictures, maybe even a, a telephony of some kind. And, um, and if we can do that uh, and, and I can uh, mix that, that, that listening mojo into uh, the, 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 the matter so it isn't just puzzles and, um, and, and hacking and, and slashing, um, then, 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 then I can, can get, get people really emotionally connected to this narrative, to this, this uh, story world. world. And, and that became uh, my, my own narrative. narrative. That, that became the rest, the rest of my life. life. Um, 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 I, began I began to experiment, experiment with this in the 1990s. And, um, um, uh, I made, I made some, some video games. games. Anybody, Anybody old enough, enough to play uh, Nintendo, Nintendo 64? <laughs> <laughs> Turok, Turok Dinosaur, Dinosaur Hunter. Hunter. That, that was me. me. Um, uh, and, and, um, and, and its various, various sequels, sequels uh, which, which did, did awfully well. well. And, and, um, and, you and you know, I was a little, little subversive while I was at the video game, game and comic book companies, companies because these, these kids, kids were, were building, building something called websites. And, and, um, um, and I said, look, I created a ton of backstory for this Turok thing. Can, can you just like throw it on the web uh, so that the fans can see? And uh, they said, no, sure, it didn't cost anything. And, um, and the servers would crash at, at Acclaim Entertainment because uh, a, a million uh, uh, kids were trying to see uh, some clues for how to play the game better and, and read the, sto the backstory of Torok and, and so forth. Uh, it was awesome. And, um, and I began to correspond with them, um, which is tough because I had an AOL account and was getting tens of thousands of emails every day. <laughs> um, uh, but I learned from, from gleaning. I read every single email. <laughs> Um, and, uh, and I could figure out what they liked and what they didn't like and how to adjust the, the sequel game and, and so forth. It was, uh, it was really great. Uh, and by the way, after Turok came Magic the Gathering, um, where I adapted my Dungeons and Dragons campaign. Corindor became a part of Dominaria, uh, the universe of, of Magic the Gathering. And, um, and never let it be said that playing Dungeons and Dragons wasn't going to be a little profitable because I made some money. I moved out of the Lower East Side. Um, uh, so um, eventually I formed Starlight Runner Entertainment um, and formalized uh, a methodology that I would come to call a transmedia storytelling. Um, um, I, I put a hyphen between trans and media because I, I made up that term when asked what, what it is that I did. Um, uh, and, uh, and came to realize that Henry Jenkins of MIT had, had utilized that term, and, um, and out of respect, I dropped my hyphen. <laughs> um, uh, Convergence Culture was his book. 
And, um, and so uh, off we, we, we went. Um, uh, we became uh, really good at doing this. Um, and um, uh, essentially, uh, we, we had to develop a language around this methodology so that it could be sold and, um, and keep us in, in business. And it had to do with maximizing the value of intellectual property. Um, uh, with the turn of the century, um, the things that I, I saw in the 80s w was certainly coming true. Uh, a generation is growing up absorbing story in a very, very different way. They are uh, truly um, uh, uh, flowing from one media platform to the next without even thinking about it. And, um, um, and they're not um, reabsorbing the same stories nearly as much uh, over and over again. In other words, uh, one piece of content is not being reviewed nearly as much as when we would watch an episode of the Brady Bunch 40 times when, when we were uh, uh, younger. There's too much variety out there. Um, so reaching people with the same kind of narrative world, but in different iterations on different media, seemed like a natural uh, way to go about things uh, to me. And, um, and we developed this method for doing that that um, um, became very successful and very quickly um, uh, these huge companies were coming to us asking us uh, to, to help them out with it. Um, so essentially what we're doing with these intellectual properties, um, these popular properties, brands and big movies and things like that, uh, are that we are determining uh, the essence. We're listening. We're, we're uh, engendering trust between ourselves and our clients by immersing ourselves in their uh, intellectual property, in their story world, and understanding it intrinsically and then demonstrating that understanding to them so that they go, you know what? You know this thing better than me. <laughs> I trust you to now move across an entire company, the Walt Disney Company, Microsoft, and, and help them uh, uh, implement an authentic extension of this narrative universe um, uh, on different media platforms. Um, and, and then we became kind of diplomats, um, and sometimes we're dealing with bullies, <laughs> um, uh, trying to align uh, stakeholders, that's different executives at the company, uh, licensees, uh, third-party developers and things like that behind a cohesive narrative uh, uh, universe. Um, uh, and then we help them to plan how to implement across these platforms this story world over the course of months or even years. Um, Transmedia storytelling, uh, from, from our perspective, people, is, is a technique, it's a method, okay? Uh, which means it's teachable, you don't have to be a, 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 a massive expert at all things geek. <laughs> um, it's, um, it's a process to convey messages, themes, or storylines to a mass audience through the artful and well-planned use of multiple media platforms. We put artful in there <laughs> to, to chase away the people who would just say, oh, you know, let's break this thing into three and slap it on, on three different media. Um, or, or let's tell the story, but I'm going to pull together a dozen people to fabricate the story by committee. Um, the storyteller, good storytellers are rare and ought to be honored and uh, treated well, just like those mangaka were uh, in, in Japan. Um, uh, a visionary is, um, is still very, very important in the, um, uh, um, in the creation of narrative. So when you use this kind of philosophy of communication, um, it, it can broaden the life cycle. It makes these things last longer, and it builds incredible loyalty. Um, uh, so, uh, to, to kind of put it simply, and thanks to uh, Robert Pratton for uh, a variation on this slide, if you, um, if you look at um, a, a movie 
and then get excited about the movie and go out and, and, uh, and purchase the novel. The, uh, the novel might be actually better than the film, but uh, sometimes it's a novelization and it's worse. Um, and then if you're of a certain generation, you uh, would run out and buy the video game of the movie, and you and I both know that those suck. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> the totality of, uh, of your experience starts to diminish. Uh, the sum is uh, uh, not um, uh, greater than, than, it just sucks. Um, it, it just, it, it deteriorates. With uh, transmedia narrative, you can think of uh, these different elements as almost puzzle pieces. They are complete unto themselves. So you can enjoy uh, any single one of these elements because it has a beginning, middle, and end. But collectively, um, you can see how they kind of fit together. You're actually making a mental leap to, to put these things together. And when they fit, there's something kind of nice about that because generally life fits together. Um, it, it actually takes some tooling, some artistry to fabricate something like this. Um, and, um, and so the, there's enjoyment in, in diving deeper and deeper and seeing how the entire uh, story world uh, uh, fits together. Um, the result of that is that you become even subconsciously aware that the storyteller is listening to you. The storyteller cares enough to do this, to go the extra mile and make this, this happen, and that's what creates a kind of internal euphoria, but an external community, a fan base. Think about um, all the things that have tremendous fan bases. It's because they are rich and deep and cohesive. They have a certain integrity to them, no matter how bizarre or, or um, uh, archaic. And, um, and that's, um, that's what transmedia storytelling is, uh, is becoming and why it's becoming dominant. Um, think of each media platform as a kind of musical instrument. Uh, each one by itself is perfectly capable from now until forever of creating something quite beautiful, self-contained, and, um, and long-lasting. So I am not saying we are supplanting um, uh, these individual media platforms with transmedia. All I'm saying is that there is something uh, beautiful and elegant about layering them, about designing a kind of orchestral narrative, uh, a narrative tapestry that, um, uh, that we can actually become a part of because there is a component of dialogue in it. There is an architecture that allows us to give feedback into it and feel as if we are being heard and sometimes even folded into the mythology of, of the narrative. In the old school, you thought about the intellectual property, the idea, the concept, the message. You chose your medium and, um, and you produced for it. In the, uh, in the new school, you are creating the world of the narrative. You are making the narrative rich enough so that it can be extended out into a, a, a variety of media platforms or the media platforms that you have at hand. Um, and there I am working with Johnny Depp and, and Jack Sparrow and, and all of Pirates of the Caribbean um, uh, applying this. You see, uh, companies are still quite siloed. Uh, companies are, um, are not used to um, uh, working communally and, um, and taking and understanding the essence of the narrative what makes the narrative so resonant and important to people and making sure that that element is infused into the various pieces of content that, um, uh, that uh, radiate out from it. 
uh, that they're trying to make money from. Um, and, and so uh, our job at Starlight Runner uh, from 2000 on was uh, to, to do just that, to understand, to do our little threshold assessment um, uh, and, and tell the company what it is that makes this special. It's not just Johnny Depp, although he's got a lot to do with it. Um, it's the story world and how to maintain the integrity of that world, um, um, whether we're uh, creating content for little kids or uh, uh, creating content on the Disney Cruise Lines uh, and so forth. Now remember guys, think of where I started. <laughs> and now I'm at Playa Vista um, in the middle of the Battle of Home Tree. <laughs> um, I'm able to stand in the middle of the, of the set, the studio, because the cameras can't pick me up. Um, and, um, and there's Sigourney Weaver hurling herself <laughs> uh, past an imaginary explosion with all of these, this apparatus on her head. It's amazing. Um, and um, um, and we're, we're, we're applying this with uh, some of the, uh, uh, the biggest geniuses in, in all of entertainment. Um, uh, guys, nerd dreams can come true. <laughs> Um, Microsoft called us and said, uh, you know, um, here's a, a property that's gigantically successful on one medium. Can it be successful across multiple media platforms? Can it become, uh, can a video game become as popular as a Star Wars or, or a Harry Potter? And, um, and sometimes uh, all it needs is a, a, a little boost in, in terms of its humanity, in terms of, of the aspirational components of the narrative. And, uh, and when Microsoft did that, uh, they got a multi-platform uh, success. And, and Steven Spielberg is uh, uh, developing a TV series uh, based on Halo, I think, for, for Showtime. Um, Men in Black um, was, was awesome. Uh, this is the, the entire universe of Men in Black is in that uh, mythology document. That's a 20-pound a, 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 a book <laughs> um, that runs hundreds and hundreds of pages that documents the entire crazy story world of Men in Black. Um, so the, um, the Will Smith and Tommy Lee Jones characters, they take up... 10 or 20 of those pages, but the rest are devoted to this giant cosmology that's hidden within those uh, movies, those three movies, but also the video games and the comics and, and so forth. And, um, and this serves as a kind of guidebook and blueprint for how Men in Black is going to unfold over the course of the coming years. And of course, um, Spider-Man, because he's cool. <laughs> so listen, um, we're seeing uh, these uh, Hollywood uh, implementations of, of transmedia storytelling. The Marvel Cinematic Universe is the perfect example of this because it's a series of interlocked movies, but it's also a television series set in the same story world, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., which got better, by the way. Uh, and... Um, <laughs> Um, and a, a series of Netflix series that are also set in the world, but, but show a different aspect of it. Um, uh, short films that you can see on the DVDs. Um, it's grossed $6.3 billion. And that's fine for the entertainment industry. But, um, but I gotta tell you people, I never forgot <coughs> the other kids that I grew up with in the projects, um, you know, there's, there's pain and suffering in the world. And it always had occurred to me that the job that I was doing emerged from how I was dealing with that pain and suffering. So is it possible to turn this thing around and apply what I've learned um, uh, back to 
the world? Um, the answer uh, is yes. Now, I'm going to uh, start talking about population activation. And for the next little while, um, we'll, we'll, um, we'll hear a general overview. Um, how I came to start doing this and some of the particulars of the, um, of the uh, cases that, that I've dealt with, we're going to take care of in a, in a conversation after this, um, this, this talk is done um, so that we can really get candid and, and, and uh, talk turkey. So uh, forgive me if, if I'm, I'm fairly broad here, but I think you still uh, can get something out of this. So stories can affect change, um, not necessarily uh, just the stories that are told to us, but stories that we share uh, among ourselves. Um, uh, in the early 1970s, when in the United States there was um, a, a, a virulent, still uh, a racial divide, uh, we, uh, we got a television series uh, called All in the Family. And, um, and at the center of this series was a bigot, uh, a, a kind of negative character, uh, Archie Bunker. Um, uh, Archie would be allowed to express um, in his own dumb, sort of funny way, the anxieties and fears uh, that white people felt about... Um, uh, the growing uh, power of minorities in in this country, um, uh, but um, but what I learned was that Norman Lear, who uh, was was very daring to to kind of get the show made, um, thought about this seriously as a responsibility, and he found uh, a woman who uh, could help him think about. Um, how to, to, to balance, how to, um, to install uh, the, the dialogue that the country needed to hear into the show. Uh, her name was uh, Virginia Carter. She was a scientist. Um, and, um, and she advised Lear um, ab about um, the potential impact that this show could have on American society. And, um, and she, she said, um, she, she gave advice about how to handle the Archie Bunker character. Um, she said, you know, he can't be a flat-out villain. You have to make him right once in a while. <laughs> um, uh, the, the, uh, the character had to be somewhat uh, sympathetic. And she worked with the, the cast. Everyone had some input into how it was delivered. And, um, and lo and behold, it it launched this conversation, this amazing conversation, as well as a series of television series that were kind of in interconnected. There was a kind of all-in-the-family story world. Um, the Jeffersons, Good Times, uh, Maud, uh, that, um, that engaged in a conversation about social issues that I feel uh, helped to spur uh, that overt discussion in the United States that led to social change. If we see something all around us, it starts to feel, it starts to become real. Um, in 1969, um, uh, a Peruvian television network uh, launched a novela, a soap opera, called Simplemente Maria. Uh, it was the story of a, a farm girl who falls in love with a city slicker, um, and, um, and she and her son are whisked away from the farm and brought to the, the city, and then she is promptly abandoned by her Latin lover. She has to become a housemaid in order to survive. Um, uh, what was remarkable was that um, uh, Simplemente Maria depicted honestly for the first time the horrific conditions that uh, home workers were exposed to in, um, in Peru and throughout South America. Um, they were abused. They were treated um, like slaves. It was, it, was, uh, it was very, very 
awful for them, so, but it was never discussed. So when people saw it happening uh, on television, it sort of gave them permission to start talking about it, and it got into the press and so forth. Later in the series, um, Maria um, uh, sneaks out at night and takes uh, classes. She educates herself uh, in order to get out of this awful uh, uh, situation. Um, now, the series being a soap opera, the city slicker eventually comes back and re-sweeps her off her feet and they live happily ever after and, and so forth. But, um, but what really happened um, was that millions of women went out and took night courses. Um, people began uh, educating themselves in, in these various countries and, um, and it, it had a huge impact. Um, it sparked, to a certain degree, um, uh, the women's movement, which had been lagging behind the North American uh, women's movement and, um, and created uh, real uh, social change, a soap opera. Um, this project anticipated uh, what I think Katie Elmore talked about last week, which was the Sabido method. Uh, Miguel Sabido uh, at uh, Televisa in the early 1970s uh, became aware that it would be important to make uh, novellas in part socially relevant um, so, that, um, so that issues, uh, real topical issues, instead of just pure uh, romance and, and uh, uh, schlock, uh, could, uh, could be discussed in, in soap operas and spark um, uh, some uh, social change. Uh, the Sabido method is used by the Population Media Center and, and other uh, 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 non-government organizations throughout the world where they're, um, where they're still using television soap operas and even radio uh, uh, soap operas to uh, teach um, uh, locals um, things like uh, the fact that, that it's important to wash your hands after handling certain foods and, and, and so forth. So when enough people share a concept, they will act. Um, in, uh, in 2008, um, there were uh, rising tensions in Athens, Greece, uh, between the uh, police, who uh, were becoming more and more uh, brutal uh, with the uh, population, and, um, and in, in this particular case, a 16-year-old uh, kind of flipped off a cop uh, and, um, and got shot for his, his troubles. Now, um, what nobody anticipated was that uh, at that time, uh, mobile phones had started to proliferate. And uh, instead of using them uh, for um, a kind of uh, uh, primitive selfies and, um, <laughs> and, and uh, texting each other for a date, uh, they, they took them out and took pictures. And those pictures got everywhere. And within um, uh, 24 hours, uh, there was a, uh, a Facebook page. And um, uh, uh, within uh, 36 hours, people were starting to march in protest against what was going on. Um, this erupted into riots. Tens of thousands of people uh, stormed the streets. They were outraged. They began to put videos of those um, protests onto YouTube. Uh, you saw protesters being assaulted by government forces. Um, neighboring countries expressed sympathy for this and began to cover it on their channels. Um, there were even people who broke into uh, the antenna network and commandeered a news program and issued uh, their complaints right there live from, uh, from the set. Uh, the Greek parliament had no choice but to say, look, we are going to deal with uh, this um, uh, police situation. And, um, and they uh, imposed new restrictions. The law changed as a result. This was uh, what we call a spontaneous self-organized system. There was no real leader. Um, involved in all of this, it just kind of happened and cascaded 
across multiple media platforms and, uh, and the result was change. Um, it was a story that was retold uh, uh, hundreds and then millions of times that became a story that was owned by an entire population. Um, not long after um, the, uh, the Egypt situation began, I asked a professor uh, who uh, was in New York uh, from Egypt, um, isn't it amazing that Facebook and Twitter um, uh, you know, allowed for this freedom wave to start and, and for, for this, these, these big changes to start happening in, in Egypt? And he said, well, they didn't free us, social media. Uh, they were tools we used, but we had women using mimeograph machines uh, to, to disseminate the information to create these massive protests. Um, what really happened, the true tipping point was, um, uh, had happened a few months earlier uh, during the elections. For some reason, when the parliament retained power, when everybody knew that, um, that they ought not to have because the vote was overwhelmingly against them, and yet they, there they were, <laughs> Um, the, 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 the election was apparently um, altered. Um, they did not tell them why, why they were there. They didn't even explain um, uh, away the corruption. They didn't tell us a story, <laughs> they said. And that cut it. <laughs> there was nothing to, to believe in anymore. And that um, uh, sparked the dissent that, that, um, that turned into... Uh, those uh, Titanic um, uh, 2011 um, uh, protests. They didn't even tell us uh, a story. Um, so, you know, when enough people act, uh, things start to, to change. Um, <clears throat> while I was growing up um, and, and coming to realize that... Um, that story worlds were kind of like mechanisms. They were kind of like the engine that you can take apart uh, in a car. Um, I wanted to know how to do that. What is it about a story world, these rich, sophisticated worlds, um, that made them so convincing? Uh, well, um, I um, uh, propelled myself to visit with the masters at my local library. And, uh, and what I learned from uh, uh, people like Joseph Campbell and Carl Jung um, were, was that there are elements of narrative that are hardwired into our brains from prehistory. We needed to know uh, why the world was what it was. Um, we were scared. Um, we became distinguished as animals by understanding that we existed, that, um, uh, that the, the, the self-knowledge made us tremendously lonely and frightened individuals. Um, so we wanted to know that the sun was going to come up tomorrow morning. We wanted to know that this freezing season was going to end eventually. And, um, and the only real solution to that was to start to tell ourselves an explanation, a story. And a story became the most compelling way short of directly experiencing something which was very, very dangerous for prehistoric humanity. Um, uh, story was, was the best way to absorb the information and, um, and take the appropriate action. Um, we are hardwired for this, and, um, and there are only a certain number of iterations of story that can be told, okay? There are only a certain number of kinds of characters you can have, these archetypes that resonate deep inside every human being. Um, and, um, and so I came to realize that there is a kind of grand narrative that drives the entire human race, a certain set of values um, that, um, that all of us um, uh, have in common. Um, 
sometimes uh, societies fall out of sync with their own fundamental uh, values. They're, 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 they, they fall away from the narrative that had made them a successful people. And, um, and so the, the, the notion that I had was that maybe there's a way to empower us to fall back in line, to, to relink with those uh, archetypal fundamental values uh, uh, to make ourselves stronger in times of weakness, um, to make ourselves kind of um, um, uh, rise up when we are being embattled, oppressed, isolated, um, uh, to give us back our voice when we've lost it. Um, uh, I think there's a methodology now that can allow for the provocation of discussion, uh, realization, and action. Um, and um, um, it, is, uh, it is transmedia narrative. <clears throat> um, what I'm talking about is not the assertion of our narrative on to the narratives of those in other countries. We've tried that. <laughs> um, it often doesn't end well. Um, so this isn't about propaganda. This is about reconnecting local storytellers with the foundational mythologies of their people, the values that espoused the preservation of life, the seeking of knowledge, and the hunger for freedom common to all human beings, but specified with their cultural mythology, with, with the thing that made them unique as a people. So this is about uh, empowering those storytellers to leverage traditional and digital platforms to communicate these narratives, to enlighten, to inspire, and ultimately to call to action. Okay, um, I think that, uh, that this is an evolving process, but it is a process that is happening, that is being implemented, and that is working. All right? Um, you can imagine how strange it was to get a phone call from the Obama administration. I'm... <laughs> <laughs> I'm Jeff Gomez, and yes, I, I dabble with the, uh, the Navi and the Pirates, but, uh, but not necessarily with Washington, D.C. Um, <clears throat> uh, um, uh, the administration was new. They were sifting through research done into um, uh, ways of dealing with things like um, asymmetrical warfare and, um, and self-organizing systems. These were new challenges that, um, that are being faced by governments all around the world. Um, uh, and I thought that was kind of cool uh, that they would actually go through Bush's research, his think tanks that, that were commissioned, because I'm not sure that, that the previous administration actually looked at the information. Um, so so they, they found um, a term that they were unfamiliar with, transmedia. Uh, they, um, they found the person, Jordan Greenhall, who talked about it, and, uh, and Jordan said, oh no, I was just really quoting Jeff Gomez. <laughs> Ring, um, uh, can you come down uh, to uh, uh, DC and talk to us about transmedia? Um, this, was a, this was a tough call because the branch of, of government that I was called down to was, uh, let's just say, military-oriented. Um, and, um, and I know that, um, that it actually is fairly easy to weaponize transmedia methodology. You only have to do one thing. Remove the architecture for dialogue. Okay, that's all. Then, what you really have is not transmedia, but it is super propaganda, right? Which you can use 
uh, for all kinds of, of reasons, uh, one of them being to kill people. And I wasn't interested in that. Um, uh, so I had to do some soul searching, and the bottom line is um, uh, they didn't know how to do this, so I was holding a few cards and, and said, look, you, um, um, uh, you, you do it my way, or you find someone else. And you'll find them, because they're out there. Transmedia producers, they're cropping up everywhere. Um, but if you want me, uh, we're not going to, to hurt people if we can at all help it. Um, uh, we're going to, uh, to do this. We are going to avoid counter-narratives, okay? So that's number one. If you come away with anything about population activation, come away with the fact that you need to avoid counter-narratives. Why? Because um, if you're in a crisis situation, if, if something uh, uh, that involves violence or corruption, crime, uh, is, is coming down, extremist thinking, then you're asking us with a counter-narrative to argue with people who often are not in their right mind. And that is a waste of time. Okay? So, um, so what the kind of, of narrative we're talking about is, is a narrative that inspires people to remember who they are, <laughs> inspires people to understand uh, that they can become empowered uh, by raising their voices in concert, okay? That they can become empowered by um, broadcasting their story so that there is an audience somewhere that sees what's going on, so they become less invisible. Um, and what we've discovered is that when a population starts to feel as if there is a concern, whether that's by neighboring communities, by neighboring countries, or the whole world, things start to change quickly. They, they actually become emboldened. They become more brave and act collectively in a more and more effective manner. Um, and, and that's where change actually occurs, okay? Um, so, I'm going to go through uh, briefly this process, and then we'll talk about it in a, a, a little bit more uh, detail, okay? Now, guys, this is not definitive, and this is highly simplified because I have like 15 minutes. But, um, but here we go, okay? Um, threshold assessment, <laughs> people. We begin... Uh, with uh, encountering uh, some kind of crisis and envision an idealized solution that might be of benefit to the majority of the population. We then study the root causes of the crisis as well as the population's varied social, behavioral, and mediated response to it. Okay? You just need that information dump. You, you need to, to analyze as much as possible. And uh, being... A geek helps, because you love data. Data, data, data. Data capture and micro-narratives. Um, it's vital to truly understand the crisis and its place in the daily lives of the people and determine what elements are interfering with their ability to respond effectively to the problem. So we use, at Starlight Runner, uh, we have associates that have proprietary data capture methodologies um, but the one that I love the most is called the micro-narrative, okay? The micro-narrative is uh, finding a cross-section of the population that you're looking for and asking them a question that elicits a story, okay? The question needs to be broad enough so that when they answer, it's not their opinion about an issue. They're relating what it is that happened to them. Um, they're telling you about their lives, and, um, um, and you're guiding it in a very subtle manner. And, um, and this is difficult because what you wind up with is, is thousands of pages of content that you have to sift through. But uh, I read the uh, Dungeon Master's Guide. <laughs> it was hundreds of pages. So I'm gonna, we're, we're going to go through it. And, um, and what happens is you, you start to see these amazing, 
patterns. Uh, sometimes you see uh, patterns in terms of negative space, what they won't talk about, and that's loaded with, uh, with information also. While we're doing that, we're also uh, ass assessing the cultural foundation um, of, of the country, of, of, the, of the, the, G, 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 the region that is in question. Who are they? What are they like? Where did they come from? What is their, uh, what, what is their belief system? What is their mythology? We're especially interested in the local uh, folklore and mythos um, that is foundational. This goes long, long, long uh, before whatever religions have been imposed in, in recent centuries. Uh, we want to know um, uh, what uh, 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 culturally is resonating in their hearts from an archetypal uh, uh, standpoint. Um, so we're also talking with historians, thought leaders, academics. Um, uh, we, are, we are reviewing their media, their television for the past 10, 20, sometimes 30 years um, uh, to understand the context for the crisis. Um, patterns emerge between this analysis and the population data. Uh, we see trauma, um, a cultural trauma, national trauma that sometimes is recurring. Um, uh, and we can see where cultural strengths are being suppressed, the values are being suppressed, the imposition of artifice or extremes over the liberty and progress of uh, these people. We then use story structure, in this case, epic narrative. That is the best um, uh, uh, story structure to use when lay, laying it against the, the long-term malaise of an entire people. Um, um, and um, an epic narrative uh, is, is very special. When you think about the epics, what they really were, what they became, was kind of the, the national anthem uh, for, for entire uh, cultures. Um, uh, the Odyssey, the Iliad, uh, Beowulf. Uh, these were um, uh, the quintessence of, of a people. Um, it is the song that is their story. And, um, and so we listen for it and, and try to understand the epic narrative, uh, the grand narrative of an individual uh, people. And, um, um, and we use this structure to frame um, the uh, uh, individuals who comprise the population as heroes. You are the hero. When you think of, of Odysseus, he is the hero to, to all of, uh, of, of Greece. Um, it, is, um, um, it is a journey that these people are on that, um, that, uh, that, and they're facing a crisis that has to be overcome. So what story do you tell yourself to remind you of when you were uh, at your best, when you were at your ideal in terms of facing such a crisis? What values drawn from your cultural history can solve this problem? What kinds of characters are bigger than this problem that could emerge from you? Um, what traits will, will get the job done? Uh, we, we find these. Um, uh, the way, in some ways, that we find them in uh, big popular movies and uh, games and, and novels. Um, we then write it all down. Um, we call this the, the mythology document because it's, it's kind of that, that guidebook, like uh, the Men in Black book that I showed you before. But really, it's a concept and a persuasion uh, that, um, that can allow for this implementation. It becomes a guidebook, a kind of uh, uh, blueprint. Uh, it contains an overview of all the information uh, that, uh, that I just talked about. It diagnoses the crisis and offers a narrative-based solution to be implemented across a variety of digital and traditional media platforms. Um, this document um, uh, you know, sells 
the implementation. Um, and uh, it could also contain uh, story templates, uh, examples of actual stories that can be used. Um, um, often analogous to the situation going on. In other words, um, we don't advise uh, our, our partners, our clients, to tell didactic stories that, that, um, that mirror exactly what's going on in the country. Um, that can be really explosive. That could uh, annoy um, people with guns. Um, uh, so, um, so often we, we ask them to create uh, analogies. And, um, and people are, are fairly quick on the uptake. They get it. Um, so, um, uh, so, so that's what's done. And then we invent a kind of rollout strategy, a, a kind of uh, transmedia superstructure um, with a kind of blue sky implementation process. How do you do that? Well, it's very similar to the way that blockbuster movies plot their campaigns. Um, there's, there's a run up to the big story. The, 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 um, as we get closer to the release, there's more and more uh, out there. Then the, uh, the driving platform takes over and, um, and there's a, a proliferation of content around it, um, uh, some promotions and things like that as the movie uh, rolls out. And then, um, and then there's, uh, there's some bridging um, uh, uh, content that happens afterward while uh, the entire campaign is assessed and we, we think about a sequel. Um, then we let it go. We have to find visionaries on the ground in the region in question who can tell stories. Visionaries often who are negatively impacted by the crisis. Um, uh, they want to help. Uh, there are corporations that want to help. Sometimes we have to avoid working with the government because the government is messed up. Um, or the, the bureaucracy is impossible. So um, uh, a coalition of partners is uh, found and, um, and they, they kind of pool their resources. A kind of clearinghouse for the narrative is, is built so that it can be monitored as it's uh, uh, implemented. And, and most of all, great storytellers are found, whether that's at uh, uh, television networks or um, uh, uh, thought leaders or uh, religious figures or, or whomever, they're, they're uh, found. Uh, they, they come in, they're, they're briefed, um, and, uh, and they're given the essence of the narrative, but they're told to create the story out of their own uh, imaginations, their own voice. Um, uh, then there's the, the multi-platform narratives. Uh, supported with uh, social services. So because citizens access content these days from all kinds of different media, uh, the campaign narratives have to be designed to leverage the strengths of different platforms. And the narratives we advise ought to be self-contained, yet reinforce one another from a message uh, standpoint. Um, they cannot contradict one another, and that's why we work so hard to create that core narrative infrastructure. Um, uh, you know, uh, sometimes it's, it's difficult. Uh, things go awry. Uh, people interpret um, what, what it is that's being um, espoused in wildly different ways. And um, <laughs> uh, nothing's perfect. But um, uh, generally, it, it, um, it, it can and does work. Uh, simultaneously, information and social services uh, uh, have to be offered. It's not just about telling a story. It's telling a story and saying, oh, by the way, we've opened up these little, um, uh, you know, walk-ins, these little offices that are going to give you more information or assist you in some way to spread the word or, or, um, or support a project um, that uh, allows for people, individuals, private citizens to express themselves about uh, what's going on. Okay, so this empowers and allows 
uh, individuals to activate themselves. Um, uh, there has to be this architecture for dialogue. All right, so the production process always has to provide forms for feedback uh, and when possible, direct dialogue. Um, citizens must be encouraged to express themselves, tell their stories, and know that they are being heard. Um, and, and, and that listening has to be authentic. Uh, efforts must be made to, to effectively weave people uh, into the, the narrative. Um, to, to show uh, that, that people, um, en masse, if, if necessary, because sometimes this is dangerous for, for an individual, um, uh, they, they can see themselves in this. And when they do, they take such great ownership of it. They become fans of their own implementation, and it, it, it drives loyalty and persistence. Okay? Um, and, um, and, and they come to realize that their actions are making a difference. Finally, there's the implementation and data capture. Uh, uh, the platforms are determined. Sometimes there's not much money involved, so the platforms have to be the, one, the ones that are at hand that are free. Um, in, some, uh, in some situations, there's just mobile phones and, and word of mouth. Um, so uh, platforms are de determined, rollout strategy is designed before the production commences. Uh, we then proceed with timetables, budgets, all the things that typify um, media uh, production, uh, matching the talent to the medium, finding sponsors, methods of distribution, and, um, uh, and then uh, sometimes original content is commissioned but often core messaging is integrated into established content, just like the Sabido uh, method, uh, uh, storylines in uh, soap operas and, and things like that. Um, data capture capability must be built into all aspects of the implementation so that we can modify and improve the campaign and measure whether uh, it's being uh, effective. Um, uh, and, and this is fairly simple uh, 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 monitoring uh, um, methods. Okay, how does it inv uh, benefit people who are paying for this thing? <laughs> well, sometimes we offer the broad data uh, about the populations, and um, and they can uh, their companies could always use that. Um, uh, we're not offering them the micro narratives, by the way, just the broad data. Uh, uh, furnishing uh, modestly budgeted uh, aspirational entertainment. They get to sponsor something cool, concerts and things like that. Affiliation with respected celebrities and creators. Um, there's prestige associated with being a patron of emerging art, local art. Um, new avenues of distribution for content uh, uh, are, are made available, branded, sponsored. We just care that the message gets out there. You can put a billboard over it, I don't, you know, if, if you're a fairly neutral uh, party. Um, and th they're improving the quality of life in, in their region. Of course, the benefits to the local populations, what really counts. Um, uh, they are also supporting emerging artists and programs by cooperating uh, with all this. Uh, there's a direct support at a local level to develop communities. Uh, support for distribution of works to emerging artists, building relationships between companies, entrepreneurs, and communities, uh, developing community organizations, establishing new artists, creators, and celebrities, and fostering the development of a global community of politically engaged individuals. This is in addition to getting them, in some cases, truly to stand up and say, no more. Peace in Colombia is finally within reach in the midst of turbulent times in the Middle East and other parts of the world. There is an untold story of hope and success emerging out of the Americas. It is a story that reaffirms the role of responsible national leadership and effective international action in today's world. Uh, that is a quote uh, from uh, uh, just last summer. 
by President Juan Manuel Santos of Colombia. Um, he is a person who is a believer in uh, multi-platform uh, strategies uh, to improve um, uh, the state of his nation. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment, but um, uh, it is evident that, um, that leaders, national leaders, Colombia is a, you know, a progressive growing country, um, are engaged with these kinds of methodologies, understand them, and are, are promoting them in the name of peace. Um, we tell the stories uh, of our own lives. We are in control of how uh, that story uh, winds up. Um, thank you so much. Um,